Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Jerry Lynch to the show. Jerry, great to have you on. Well, you know, everyone says it's an honor, uh, but I really mean it. Uh, I, I am honored. I'm still amazed at the fact that someone like yourself would still be willing to listen to what I have to say after all these years. So uh, it's a pleasure for sure. I reframe that one straight away as any good sports psychologist would and, and, and say to you, it's actually an honor to have you on the show. And I'm, I'm surprised somebody of your stature would, would be willing to come on and, and, and spend an hour or so talking with me. So thanks right back at you, Jerry. Well, yeah. <laughs> thanks back to you. <laughs> no, uh, th- what, a, what an opportunity. You see, people say, well, why are you so honored? Well, it, you're giving me an opportunity uh, it has nothing to do with people meeting me. It has to do with me and making the effort to make a difference in the lives of people. I always tell people I'm all about not making a living as much as I am of making a difference. And, uh, you know, when, when Dan Abrams invites me on to, to reach many people on the other side of the pond, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm all over it because, uh, you know, I make a difference. That's why I'm alive. I'm your servant, Dan. Well, talking about working in servitude and talking about making a difference it's been am i right in thinking it's it's year number 58 for you in coaching this year the first year i ever coached was in 1964 wow i got a position teaching english literature right because i was an english lit major in college okay i didn't have one psychology course in college wow so uh, yeah it's a miracle that i got that far but uh, I was an English lit major, so I got a I got a position teaching English lit to high school students at Bishop Lachlan Memorial High School in Brooklyn, New York. And the principal said we we need a coach for the JV basketball team. And I raised my hand right away because I'm a I'm a hoop head, and uh, and I thought that would be fun. You know, I, I love sports, and that was the beginning of 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 my career. And uh, I haven't turned around on that. It's uh, I love what I'm doing. I, I, I didn't consider that a job. In fact, uh, between you and I and the rest of the people listening, I've never had a job and I still don't have a job, but I have a calling and uh, that calling, you know, my why is I want to change the status quo. Uh, I don't like what I see in sports. Uh, I want to make it better. I want to make it a place where everyone can be a better version of themselves. Uh I want to make a difference. I want to be able to say, you know what? I started that or, or I, had, I had an influence on making that change. And, and you know what? When, when athletes and coaches are having a better time, my life is much better. So there's a little bit of selfishness in that for sure. I like change and I like people to be able to realize their best, their best selves. So yeah, 50, 58 years ago and, uh, and guess what? Uh, I've been I've been mastering my craft for fifty eight years, and I'm only halfway there. <laughs> I I mean, it's like how much more do I need to know? <laughs> you know. Well, guess what? Uh, I'm a life learner, and uh, I continue to learn and master my craft. Well, I definitely think I'm only about ten percent of the way there. Um, already, Jerry, I have to say, you've given me a brilliant idea for a future basketball psychology book uh the title of the the book hoop head i think that's said hoop head there we go we've worked <laughs> together already to produce the title of a future basketball psych yeah. book the well the art the art of being a hoop head then you can bring in some eastern philosophy with that yeah. okay well what about what, what about the science and art of being a hoop head so we can we can go with some western scientific underpinning some eastern philosophical underpinning amalgamate those two bring it into basketball and we're there well you know i mean basketball uh any sport but if you want to go down the road of basketball i'm great with that one uh it's sacred it's you know people okay so we're talking sports psychology. Mm. When I started out in the profession, let me come in the back door on that question. 
Yeah. When, when I went out, when I, when I started to be a sports psychologist, quote unquote, whatever that happened to be at the time, yeah. uh, I was excited and my definition was quite limited in retrospect. Uh, so I was a sports psychologist, right? And I did this and I did that. But right now, if you look at my, my body of work, it's 30% sports psychology and 70% sports spirituality. And, and, and the spirituality of sport is not a, some kind of a hokey religion. What it is, it's really getting at the heart, the heart of the game, the heart and soul of athletics. And uh, that spirituality uh, has been enhanced from my taking a deep dive into, uh, I have a PhD in psych, uh, psychology, but I also have a PhD in, in um uh, comparative religions and philosophy. Okay. And, and, and I, and I can see the connection between spirituality and, and Eastern thought, uh, because Eastern thought, you know, we talk about concepts like impermanence or detachment, uh, which is what we all need to learn because we're going to lose a basketball game. So we might as well detach from that and get on with life. Right. Uh, but, uh, I 70% spirituality for those who are listening, uh, it's not, again, it's not a religion. What it is, it's, it's everyday living. For instance, uh, who doesn't want to be more courageous? You know, raise your hand if you don't want to be. Well, I don't see any hands out there going up. Uh, courage is one element of that. Courage comes from the uh, French word core, which means heart. And this is all about the heart of competing. If you compete with heart, if you coach with heart, uh, what that means is courage, uh, patience, perseverance, uh, selflessness, uh, having integrity. Uh, these are the kind of qualities. These are the kind of Buddhist and Taoist qualities, uh, egolessness, getting your ego out of it. Uh, you know, the whole idea of, uh, of humility. Uh, we got on to this call and we talked about how honored we were. Uh, I forgot to say also that how humble, how humbling it is, uh, to be able to do this. And, and these are the kind of things, uh, we're talking about being present, having gratitude. I'm training athletes, right. As a sports psychologist, quote unquote, and I'm teaching them the element of gratitude, Hmm. to be thankful for everything they've been giving. And once they're thankful and they can feel thankful for everything they've been given, their health, their, their talents physically, then I say to them, go out and compete and give back for everything you've been given. If you're grateful, then give back for all you've been given and demonstrate that on how you play, how you never give up on the, on the basketball court, how you dive for the 50-50 ball how you play in your face defense, how you crash the boards, box out. When you do all these things, what's happening is you're playing with heart. You know, one of the, one of the things uh, that's really uh, been good for me is having a, a relationship with Steve Kerr. For those of you who don't know Steve is perhaps one of the most iconic greatest coaches uh, in his young years, Golden State Warriors, uh, three-time world champions, uh, the man, the man really resonates, Dan, with what we're saying here, with, yep. with the whole idea of the spirituality of sport. And, and by the way, uh, part of that spirituality is love. Love not in the sense of a romantic love, but in caring and connection. You know, John Wooden in his retirement said the reason for my success was I had a lot of love in my coaching. You know, Phil, Phil Jackson, the winner of... 11 rings said, hey, there's a lot that goes into winning those rings. You need a lot of physical talent. You need, a, you need a lot of everything. You need some luck. But if you don't have the one essential ingredient, and he was talking about the spiritual quality of love, if you don't have that, you don't win a championship. And so I'm different. You know, um, uh, I don't find many sports psychologists out there who are walking into a team setting uh, I walked into a room full of football athletes and I took the two biggest guys in the room. Both were 325 or 350 pounds, six foot six, six foot seven. And I'm no big stature person, but I walked over to them and I asked them, did they love each other? And the first reaction was laughter. By the time we got finished, they were hugging and telling each other how much they really loved them, truly loved each other. And I say, now you can go out on the field on Saturday and play Nebraska 
and not give any one of those people on Nebraska permission to beat up on your brother. Because if you're family and you love each other, you're going to really, really stand up for each other and you're going to play your very best for each other. And so it's all rooted in that. And in and, and my beginning years, and I'll stop here in a minute, <laughs> uh, you press the button and I, I keep going. But uh, in, in my beginning years as a sports psychologist per se, mm. I was working from the outside in and I realized it's an inside out job and and. Uh, I've always had a uh, uh, connection with the spirituality of things in my life. And I saw, well, you know what? What I can do is I can walk into a group of people and I can train them. I can teach them how to be loving, caring, and connected. I could teach them how, how to be courageous. I could teach them how to have patience and perseverance. These are learned qualities. You're not born with them. And they're the highest spiritual values and virtues that one can have. And when you have... When you have those values, you go the distance and you get the most out of your teammates. You get the most out of yourself. You're your best coach. You're your best leader. You're the best mentor, the best podcast host. I mean, it's all of that, you know? <laughs> Just so, so, so fascinating and, and so much depth and breadth to your answer there. And you've used some words there, values and virtues. And I wrote down a few values and beliefs and interpretations. And I suppose as a psychologist, you know, I would, I would lean towards those words. And I, and I want to unpack a lot of what you've said with reference to, you know, at least the last 40 years of work where I know you've worked with, if work is the right term, because earlier you said that's probably the wrong term, but let's just use it right now. But worked with, you know, so many athletes at, at, at the professional level, the college level, the high school level, who've probably gone on for, to great lives, some of you've gone on to further success in their sport. But I just want to just get in that time machine and go back to the beginning again, because I just think this is fascinating when you when you sit there and you say, look, 70% of this is spirituality. When did that notion of spirituality arise in you? Um, you know, if we go back to 1964 and you took that coaching position, you obviously loved sports. You wanted to give coaching a go. This was an opportunity. You've mentioned that you started from the outside in rather than the inside out. At what point uh, did you start to go, oh, okay, actually, this, isn't, this is not only just not X's and O's. It's not just concentration and confidence and commitment and control on the court, but it's this sp spirituality piece. When did that start and how did that start? Ah, boy, what a brilliant question. Uh, and what an opening uh, f uh, to get in touch with my own journey here, you know, because it has been a long journey. And, hmm. and uh, but thank you for asking that question, Dan. It's really important to me. Uh, before I answer that, though, or give you a uh, reflect on that, uh, I don't want people to be confused. Uh, it's not work that I'm shying away from. I don't want a job. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and a job is something you do for money. Uh, yeah. Work is something you do to make a difference. And, uh, but getting back to your point, which is a brilliant one. Uh, no, in the beginning, I had no clue. There was no way I could see a connection between the head and the heart. You know, as far as I was concerned, if I took a ruler, it's 18 inches from the head to the heart. <laughs> but in my world during that time, it might as well be 18,000 miles. I mean, I, I just had no no idea about that. But what, what happened to me was, uh, you know, after I finished my graduate program and got my doctorate in psychology, I was very, very unhappy with the state of the art, so to speak. And I dropped out of psychology. Uh, I didn't like it. The system seemed broken. And uh, this is not sports psychology. This is just like clinical psych stuff. And uh, so I dropped out and I moved to Colorado, Boulder, uh, Colorado. And for those of you who don't know, back back in the day, uh, it still is. It, it, it's one of the running meccas of, in the world. And I was becoming a competitive runner. And I thought, well, if I'm going to take this to the, to the top, what I'm going to do is I'm going to live among the greats. And I went out there and I worked in Frank Shorter's running store. He was an Olympic gold medalist. We had, uh, we had 14 people, 13 people working in that store who were all Olympian caliber runners. Wow. Uh, it, yeah. 13. I was surrounded by that. Now I was not an Olympic caliber runner. I mean, I was, 
I could have gone to the trials with a little more work, but I, I was not of their level for sure. But I trained and I worked. And one of the runners there, he and I uh, would go for long, long runs in the Colorado Rockies. When I say long, I'm talking about five hours. We would go out for a five hour run. Well, this runner happened to also be a, uh, a professor at the university and he was teaching Chinese philosophy. So I, his name was John. I go out with John and uh, God, we'd be up in Rocky Mountain National Park and we'd be running and running and running and seeing deer and coyote and all kinds of birds. And we'd stop and we'd look at plants, you know, they'd have berries on them. And he said, Jerry, you can eat these berries. And, and the conversation would always go to the Tao, you know, Taoist thought. And uh, he point out to me how, uh, for instance, he would say to me, you know, Jerry, you, you're worried about losing that race. But the Tao says quite poignantly, when we lose, we actually win. And uh, I forget what verse that is in the Tao Te Ching. But, but the point is, is that I had these conversations and I started to see the connection between Eastern thought and how that could help me in a Western mind. And, and so I pursued that and I, I would attend class. I'd go to class with him and, and listen to him talk. And I started reading voraciously and what have you. And the further I went in competing, the better I started getting and the, and, and the more competitive I was. And uh, I was running, uh, winning. I won a national championship. I, uh, I've done many things with running. But having said that, uh, it was the Eastern thought that really helped me to detach from my losses and learn from my losses and so many other things that we wouldn't have time to dive into here. But that was the beginning. And then at that point, I wanted to write because of my English lit background. I, I just, once, once I saw the connection, I just thought, well, God, I can help some athletes here. And so I would go back to the store and talk to the Olympians and uh, I would show them. I said, did you, did you ever think that, you know, this could be this way, or you could think this way about it. And they, they'd like, Oh my God, that's really interesting. Mm. And I thought I'm onto something here. And, uh, so, uh, one thing led to another. And before you know it, uh, I pursued that, that venue. And when I started with sports psychology, it wasn't really easy to convince people, uh, that this was something, uh, that they should really dive into. They thought, Maybe they thought like I was kind of um, uh, way out there kind of thinking. And I had a hard time, you know, because I knew it worked and I knew it was valid and I knew how people craved it. But they so what I had to do is I had to take away the uh, the Eastern philosophy flag and just bring them the concepts. And then once I just brought in the concepts, they didn't think that this was something from, you know, Buddhism or something else. And, and then all of a sudden, everything seemed to gel and work out and. Uh, before you know it, uh, I wrote, you know, my career launching book, which was Thinking Body, Dancing Mind. And I wrote that with a uh, uh, one of my partners, uh, Al Wong, uh, who translated the books from Chinese to uh, to English. And uh, that was the launching pad that launched my career. And from that point on, every book that I wrote has had the influence of Eastern thought. And I'm happy to say, Dan, I never have to sell this stuff. People are coming after me, not because of me as much as they want a piece of what this kind of thinking is all about. You know, after 120, I think now, after 120 championship teams at the professional college and high school level using Eastern thought with Western psychology, people are craving it. People come to me and they want it. They say, can we have a piece of that? You know, uh, giving a talk uh, in two months, a month and a half to over 300 athletic directors. The athletic directors want, can you imagine an athletic director has a cast of characters, maybe 25, 30 coaches on their staff, and they want to know how they can influence those coaches by using this kind of thinking. And uh, that was the beginning and uh, it continues to blossom. What year was your first book? Well, my first book was a book on running, uh, and it was on running because I worked in a running store, and I was surrounded by runners all the time, and I just applied mm. some psychology to running, and it was called The Total Runner. And, and, and with regard, just dwelling on the running just briefly, um, 
you genuinely attribute what you learnt on those runs with that professor, the Eastern philosophy, to helping you manage your capacity to deal with kind of the feelings, the emotions, the thoughts that flew in and out of your conscious mind while you were running, away from running, during season, away from season, during competition. Ultimately, it helps you run faster, enjoy it more. Is that what you're saying? Uh, absolutely. There is mm. no question. Absolutely. Uh, run faster means uh, the, the thinking doesn't make you run faster. What it allows you to do is allow that innate, innate ability that you have to run faster yeah. to be free to run. So you're not judging it. I mean, if I'm out there saying, I can't do that, I can't run that fast. I, uh, it's impossible. I'll never be, if that's the case, I'll never do anything to maximize my possibility of, of realizing my full human capacity. So the thought frees me, my thinking frees me, and it opens up the possibility that if I applied myself, I can do really well. Of course, what goes along with this, and now this is becoming a household word, uh, and it's been used, it's being used as I speak with you in the training, the mental training of the US Navy SEALs. But it's also being used with uh, hospitals throughout the country uh, who are treating cancer patients, uh, patients with uh, diabetes, patients with uh, uh, Crohn's disease and all other kinds of disease. And that is the concept of meditation. Mm. And that's very Eastern, you know, that's a, that's a Buddhist concept, you know, to meditate. Well, in, in the Western world, psychologists go in and what they do is they train athletes to visualize. Mm -hmm. And they, they relax their body and they visualize. So, so, so that's how it began with me. But meditation is very different. Uh, it's related, but it's very different. Uh, you slow down the thinking process and you feel quiet. And, uh, and then what you do is you start feeling how you want to be. Uh, uh, as a runner, I want to feel myself gliding effortlessly, even though it's not always that way. Uh, over the terrain. Uh, as a basketball athlete, I want to feel myself connecting with my teammates on the court and feel what it's like to be at the next level. Uh, you know, if I want to be like a, uh, a Steph Curry, then what I got to do is I got to feel what it might be like to be a Steph Curry. And uh, so meditation uh, relaxes the body. And when the body is relaxed, your performance goes higher. Uh, the reason why a lot of people uh, don't perform up to their capability is because their muscles are tight and rigid because why? Because fear, right? You'd have to agree with me, Dan, that when you're fearful, uh, you're tight. And when you're tight, you can't perform. By the same token, you'd have to agree with me that your best performances in any sport that you've taken on, and anyone listening to me out there, they'd have to agree with me as well, that your best performances always come when you're more relaxed. You know, let's take a pickup basketball game down the schoolyard, right? In, in Brooklyn, New York on a Saturday afternoon, I played my best basketball. But once I got into the tournament in an official capacity, or I played at Madison Square Garden, which I had the opportunity to do in, in New York City, once that happens, all of a sudden I get fearful. And when you're fearful, you're tight and tense and tentative. Why? Because we can't control the outcome. What Eastern thought does and what meditation does is it helps you to realize you cannot control the outcome, so you let go of it. And the question is, so therefore, what can I control? Well, back to basketball. I can control sprinting my lanes. I can control crashing the boards. Mm. Oh, there's a 50-50 ball there. I can die for it. I can control that. You can't stop me from doing that, and you can't stop me from getting in your face playing really tough, tenacious defense. So... Eastern thought helps me to focus in on what I can control and not to focus in on what I can control and the wisdom to know the difference. It's the serenity prayer. There we go. Spirituality, a prayer, serenity now. So it's all connected. And, and so everything on those runs that I learned, I remembered. And then when I did my own research and really dug deeply into the uh, – into the books, uh, I realized, boy, there's so much out there that's applicable to, to performance and leadership and, and, uh, and life. 
Listening to you there, I heard quieten the mind, direct feelings. Quieten the mind, direct feelings optimally. I think that's fascinating. I almost wonder if the quieten the mind is synonymous with the Eastern philosophical approach directing feelings optimally might be a little bit more westernized um in terms of utilizing visualization as you said to feel like you're gliding as you're running Mm -hmm. you know you might as a basketball player you might feel like you're Steph Mm -hmm. Curry I'm a sports psychologist who's who's very into you know Jerry I was a I was a professional golfer before I became a sports psychologist and I I can I know that how I felt walking onto that first tee influenced my performance. So a lot of that, it guides my practice now. Mm -hmm. Feelings to me, I think in sports psychology, we don't talk enough about feelings, possibly because the scientific tradition doesn't deal very well with feelings. We're not very comfortable with them. But it just, I don't know if there's going to be a question here, but it just drew my attention to it's quiet in the mind, direct feelings and i love that pictorial metaphor that you you delivered there in terms of gliding gliding it, it, it that's it sounds like something quite in the mind direct feeling sounds like a central piece to what you're striving to do with athletes it it, it certainly is and uh uh dan and and, and if you're not feeling hmm. see okay so so thoughts create what do thoughts create thoughts create feeling Mm -hmm. feeling equals function function equals performance Mm -hmm. okay so let's back up so you're quieting the mind through uh methodologies such as vipassana meditation uh and the u.s navy seals i mean they're all over this i'll tell you what they do Mm -hmm. uh they'll use uh a more westernized approach, but they'll go deep into meditation and they'll quiet their mind, but they're quieting their whole body. Okay. It's almost like an out of body experience. Yep. It's almost like you're above yourself. And, and what they do is they talk about feeling yourself when you're on that helicopter and you're mm-hmm. being lowered onto the land and you're getting ready to uh, race across this piece of land and, and volley, go over the wall and enter this compound uh, to, to capture a, a Osama bin Laden as an example, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you, when you feel a certain way, you're going to function that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you get up in the morning. Let me run this by you. When you get up in the morning, you're feeling like you're feeling low confidence, you're feeling uh, intimidated, you're feeling less than, you don't feel good enough, you're feeling uh, a lack of courage, you're feeling unimportant, devalued. You'd have to agree with me, Dan, that when you get out of bed, you're not going to have a good day. It's going to be really a rough day for you. Yep. (laughs) Right. So by the same token, let's get out on, let's get, (laughs) Let's get out of bed on the other side. So you get out of bed on the other side. You know, you go to the toilet and you wash your face and you get ready and you make breakfast and and you're feeling confident and you're feeling uh, you're feeling really strong. You're feeling valued. You're feeling important. Uh, you're feeling respected. Uh, you feel like you have what you need, uh, all that you need to get whatever you want to do uh, done. Well, you'd have to agree with me there. You're going to have a really great day. You might as well like chalk that up into being Christmas, right? Or some kind of a special <laughs> morning, you know? Uh, so it's the same thing with, with, with my approach with, uh, with athletes. Well, let's get back to that. So I'll train them into meditation, period, it, with no visualization, no mental rehearsal, none of that, just, just to notice their breath and to get a feeling of what it feels like to be relaxed and to feel calm and tension flies away. It melts away. At that point, when when they feel confident that they can quiet the monkey mind and all the chatter that's going on, 
then I don't ask them. I do not ask them. Okay, so now see yourself perform. You know, imagine that you're out on the basketball court. We're still using the basketball court, but we can be in a pool. We can be on a soccer pitch, uh, wherever it takes us. Uh, you don't want to see yourself like you're watching yourself on camera. But I specifically tell them, what does it feel like? What would it feel like, the feeling inside when you're floating across the field or you're, you're sprinting down the, the court or that you're gliding across the land? What, a, what, kind of, what do you imagine? What would that feeling be like? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's say you want to uh, play basketball and, and you're watching Steph Curry. What would it feel like if you were shooting like him, if you were playing like him and playing defense like him? What, what, what the, what's the feeling? Oh, my God, it's elevated, right? It's, it's none of those lower feelings. You're confident. You're certain. You're, uh, you're, you're excited. You're inspired. You're, you're, you're important. Uh, you're making a difference. Those are the feelings that I want an athlete to really take into their nervous system because I have learned, just like getting out of bed in the morning, as I feel, I'm going to function. And I think oftentimes there are many people in our profession, Dan, who miss that piece. It's, it's, it's how to stimulate the central nervous system so that you recognize it and, and, and you flow with it and you, and you, and you hold on to that. And uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the approach. Listen to you there. For me, you're talking about the importance of intrapersonal skills, intrapersonal skills, internal skills in order to manage self, find, find one's optimal mental state, which is related to the nervous system, to, to be able to concentrate and commit and re retain a sense of control over, over oneself. You've done this for so so many years. Do you think that athletes spend enough time working on these skills? Do you think this is integrated into programs well enough yet? Or do you still think this is the poorer partner of the technical, tactical and physical components of the game? Athletes, coaches, people connected with sports would tell you What's the most important part of your game? The mental. You wouldn't get one person to argue with you. You're not going to get anyone to stand up and say, you know what? Mental doesn't matter as much as I need to know the X's and O's, or I need to know this technique, or I need to know that technique. Everyone agrees with that, but why doesn't everyone do it? My experience is that when I'm with a team and I'm regulating the direction they're going and athletes get on board and they experience once what this can do, what the mind can do and, ha and how the mind really impacts your thoughts, feelings, function, performance. Once they get that, they're more inclined to go along with it, you know, to, to, to adapt it and, and use it mm -hmm. not only in sport, but in life. And, and, and of course, Dan, being familiar with my work, uh, I'm, I'm just using, by the way, I, I'm using sport as a vehicle. I love sport and I want people to perform well in sport, but the sport is the vehicle to becoming a better version of yourself, not yep. just a better athlete, but, but life. So, so I'm teaching these, these athletes that this meditation process will help them in their studies, if they're students, in their business, if they're business people, uh, as, as fathers, mothers, leaders, mentors in life. And then I point out how, yes, the U.S. Navy SEALs, and yes, this hospital, and yes, this, this group. And so I am impressing upon them when I'm working with them the value of this. And then there's follow-up. This weekly follow up and, and I come on the scene and, and we do a meditation together. So we get to that place where they can experience that success. The problem is we admit that that's the way to go, but we don't give it enough juice. We don't give it enough time to, to evolve and, and develop. So it becomes a habit, you know, a habit. Well, I was, I was going to ask from your experiences, do you think it's done 
deliberately, intentionally, on purpose enough on the court during activities? Do you think that that's potentially where it's missing, that we could take those moments of practice uh, from whether it's the classroom, the Zoom call, um, whatever environment that's being taught in? We know we want it in the competitive environment, but I suppose it's making sure that we're all disciplined enough to do it in that environment and making it a part of activities. I've sometimes wondered, and it's a, I work with coaches every single day. I, I have been a coach. I am a coach in many respects, but I do sometimes wonder if coaches underestimate the amount of practice it requires in the environment, on the court, on the course, on the pitch, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. to be able to make it, a, let's call it, make it a habit, if you like, mm -hmm. or make it a big deal, make it important so that when it comes to game day, these athletes go out there and it's part of what they do. That's, mm -hmm. I think, where there's maybe a, a gap or a divide. Let me, uh, let, me, let me reflect on what you just said in this way. It's not a doing. It's not something you're going to go on the court and do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to. There's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a way of being, and I want to differentiate between that. Being is, it's a way. Uh, doing is like you know you you got this job to do and and you're going to do it and uh, so we have to divide sports up a little bit here, uh, Dan. If you're a golf athlete, which you've had experience with, you have a lot of time between shots to think. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of time before you take that putt if you want to do something. Now, so with golf athletes, you know, as you know, we, we, we can train golf, golf athletes uh, – to have a certain routine, a pre-shot routine, yeah. a pre a pre-putt routine. Yeah. You know, you take a deep breath, you say this affirmation, which which reinforces uh, the kind of thinking you want to have during a putt. You know, when I take a basketball athlete uh, and uh, they're struggling at the foul line, uh, I give them a pre-foul shot routine where it slows everything down. They do three dribbles. They take a deep breath. They say an affirmation, and, and, and then they're ready to release the ball. Well, all of that to keep their mind focused on one thing. But look what I'm talking about. Golf, foul shots. What's the commonality? Time. Time. When you're in a hockey arena and the, and the game is going lightning fast or you're on the soccer pitch, and you're back and forth and there are no timeouts and you're going up the field, down the field and all this, you don't have time to do anything, but you do have the ability to be a certain way. That's why the training that we're talking about is so vital and so crucial to do on a consistent daily basis when you're not on the pitch or you're not on the court because it's too lightning fast to do anything Basketball, foul shot, you can do something. Pre-putt, you can do something. But most of sports, a bobsled, 85 miles an hour, down a chute, the most you can do is take a deep breath and pray. But what really helps those bobsledders is to feel what it's like going down there and feel way, the way you feel when you're in control. To feel yourself controlling what you can. To feel what it's like to be relaxed and to take that and put yourself in the sled, for instance, and feel it all the way down. Uh, to feel yourself in the thick of things uh, in, 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 a hockey, in a hockey game. Uh, whatever game it happens to be where it's pretty fast paced. And, and that's where the work is really, really done. Now, when I, when I say that, the reason why the work's done is you're marinating your nervous system in those feelings. So it's like Pavlov's dog. You ring the bell, the dog salivates. And you feed him. Well, guess what? You ring the bell and there's no food. The dog still salivates. Well, if you're meditating every day, the meditation, the deep breath is like the bell. So when you get into a game, 
you take a deep breath, you walk on the court, and all of a sudden, guess what happens? It's like his food there. There's spiritual food. You have spiritual nuggets. I call them spiritual vitamins for the athletic soul. And, and so what happens is the deep breath is a reference point to how you felt when you were practicing last night before you went to sleep. And, you know, the nervous system is very brilliant. It's, it's very, very smart. It doesn't forget things. So if you, do, if you do your work 24, 48 hours before a performance, it's going to still be hanging out inside. And all you need to do is ring that bell or take that deep breath and you'll start to salivate. And your whole inside will start to turn into the athlete that you've been feeling yourself wanting to be. I think we've got the chapter, the first chapter of Hoophead. Marinate your <laughs> marinate your nervous system in great feelings. There we go. We've got we've got chapter one there. <laughs> and and you can have that. Don't you don't have to quote <laughs> Thank what <you>. I said. <laughs> That's yours. Thank yeah. You. And uh-huh. and uh, what really resonates with what you were talking about there for me is. In the embodiment of this to embody and to enact who you want to be to embody yeah. and to enact who you want to be yeah. and i and i think the uh, uh, moving fractionally on here i mean we're talking about the intrapersonal side of competing of playing we're talking about embodying and enacting who we want to be and not getting in our own way and utilizing things like mind meditation to be able to do that mindfulness to be able to do that and then visualization (laughs) and the interesting thing there i mean uh, alluding to what you said already about you know these sports less so golf for example but a sport like basketball it's a quick sport it works in seconds there's very little time to think you certainly don't want to be thinking that much and yet not only do we require these athletes to be skillful intrapersonally but we also require athletes to be skillful interpersonally it's like they're looking at you and they're thinking hey man i've got to be this in you know in intrapersonal whiz but i've also got to be this great teammate i've got to have these interpersonal skills i'm guessing so much of your work has also been at the interpersonal level you've mentioned some of it already i mean so much of that is what you do right absolutely uh, one of the things uh, i've really made a lot of shifting here we're talking about performance right that's what we've been spending a lot of time with yeah and and you know i I've had many years of experience with, with, with dealing with performance and helping people perform at a higher level. But now my emphasis in the last, uh, you know, is more away from a, a team now. I, I don't walk into a room that often now and work with a team. Okay. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to influence uh, the masses and mm. uh, have a bigger effect. So I do that through coaches' conferences. I do that through uh, – uh, conferences that the conference coming up with the athletic directors, 200 athletic directors. I mean, they're going to have some influence on their program as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this idea that you're bringing up is really an area where I'm really beginning to specialize more and more in. And that is uh, the whole idea of building and sustaining a championship culture and how we do that. It's all interpersonal, right. you know, it's all about, so it, it's all about, uh, Uh, The relationship game, the relationship game between coach and athlete, between athlete and coach, and also between athlete and athlete and between coach and coach on the staff. And so, uh, you know, I've written this book uh, called Win the Day, and uh, it's the ultimate coach's guide. uh, The subtitle is to to build and sustain a championship culture. And in that book, it's just filled with these ideas of how do we win the most important game of our life? (laughs) <laughs> and that game is the relationship game. And, and, and that's not sports psychology. That's just common psychological, uh, emotional, spiritual uh, talent. I'll call it talent. You know, it's not physical talent, but let's say it's a spiritual talent. And that is how to be, uh, how to be kind to people, how to be, uh, um, you know, I remember the meeting I had with, with Coach Dean Smith at the University of North Carolina. Iconic coach, like one of the best ever. Uh, championship Built a championship basketball program at the University of North Carolina in uh, Chapel Hill, Carolina. Mm-hmm. Uh, I walked into a meeting with him, just he and I, and I walked out with tears in my eyes. I was so inspired I would have done anything for that man. Well, he had the ability to 
uh, to have that skill to, to interrelate. And it was a relationship. And he made me feel, Dan, I mean, and I know this isn't true on paper, but I walked out feeling like I was the most important person in his life. And when I felt that way, I would have done anything for him. I would have licked the basketball floor of the dust <laughs> if they if they didn't have a if they didn't have a broom or they didn't have a mop. I would have gotten on all fours and done it for him. It's all about the relationship game. And in this book, I talk about how to nurture that, but I also talk about how to implement it and, and build it. So really, a lot of the emphasis. Uh, of my work right now is on how do we build a championship culture? How do we build a culture that's vision, uh, vision driven and uh, based in values? Okay. All right. So like, like a Steve Kerr with the, with the warriors, with the yep. uh, Golden State warriors. Right. So, so you look at Steve Kerr, who, by the way, he, he wrote the uh, forward uh, to this book, my book, uh, win the day. And, and in that, forward, he talks about how he established four basic values. Uh, I probably can't remember the four, but one was joy. That was the first one. Another one was compassion. Another one was selflessness. And oh, I got the four and the other one was competitiveness. So this is, this is part of the relationship game. This is part of the culture and a culture that's vision driven, but values based. And, and that's the work that I'm doing these days. And boy, it really requires communication. Okay, it requires communication, cooperation, collaboration, connection, and caring. The five major C words. And don't ask me to repeat them again. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can. Uh, but uh, yeah, cooperation, collaboration, connection, caring. That's it. And you know what? People listening to you and I, this is what's making, this is what's driving our, our session here. You know, you and I connecting, mm -hmm. feeling, uh, feeling good about each other, having good things to say about each other, caring about each other, uh, cooperating with each other, connecting, uh, collaborating. Uh, that, that's how people win in life. And that's why I call this win the day. Because if you can't win the day, you're not going to win on the basketball court. And, and we have to talk about the ways in which we can win the day. Maybe one of the things is we, we, we meditate as a practice every day so that we can feel ourselves being the human being that we really want to be. Not that there's anything wrong with us, but maybe we want to be the best version of ourselves and take it to another level. I've got a question around leadership returning to Dean Smith and your experience with Dean Smith at the university of Carolina there. Um, not North Carolina, wasn't it? Oh, sorry. I'm glad you said that. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, man. This uh, naive <laughs> Englishman around uh, college yeah. rivalries in the States. So uh, <laughs> university of North uh, Carolina. Um, you, you, you talked about leaving with tears in your eyes. This is an, this is an inspirational leader. Is that, you know, and you've mentioned about being able to help leaders, coaches as leaders become better at the relationship game. Can every leader be an inspirational leader? Because I'm thinking here of another word that seems to be coming through over the last decade, at least, which is the word of authentic. There's a lot of people who talk about oh. authentic leadership. And this, there seems to be this sort of binary divide between you know, uh, a coach as inspirational, a coach as authentic, and there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of agreement. I mean, where do you lie with this kind of thing, Jerry? Do you think everybody can be an inspirational leader? I think, I think everybody can be whatever they want to be. Okay. <laughs> right? Uh, that answers a multitude of questions that you might ask me. Uh, <laughs> that's just my mindset. And when I walk into a room, I'm, I'm hoping everyone gets that message real clearly from me, because if I can do it, you can do it. You know, I, my background is such that I should not be doing what I'm doing. There's just no way. I mean, my father never went past elementary school, right? Uh, I didn't have the background. I created this background. So to your point, Dan, very yeah. well taken. I'm so glad you brought this up. Yes, every coach, every leader, every person can be inspirational. 
being inspirational is not something we're born with. Show me a baby that's – well, I, I have to take this back. When I look at a baby, I'm inspired, <laughs> you know, right? I, I, I love these little tiny human beings, right? <laughs> and, and so I guess, I guess uh, they are inspirational, but not through any intention of their own. Yeah. But as they grow, okay, uh, what happens is we learn how to really walk into a room and light it up. We also learn how to walk into a room and cast it into darkness, See, the, pow- the power of our influence is a learned phenomenon, and that's what I teach. I will teach you, I will teach a group of coaches how to be more influential, how to use their influence. Because we know from studying this that our influence is never neutral. Now, what we want to do is we want to differentiate between the coach who walks into a room and maybe casts it into darkness or creates problems and there's roughage and, and there's – this friction versus a, a, a coach like a Dean Smith or, or, or a Steve Kerr. Uh, and we can go on. Tara Vanderbilt. There's so many coaches I can name. Yeah. Uh, but there aren't many coaches that are like that. And they have learned, whether it's through their, uh, their own experiences, up and down experiences, or they have learned because they have the desire to be that way or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it's a learned phenomenon. It's a skill set. And uh, we learn that, you know what, when I'm, when I'm really uh, affirmative, when I, when I say to you, Dan, I said, I love, I love this interview. I love the way you've created it. I love the way you've given me freedom and how organic it is and, and, and that we had no idea we were going with this. There is no set script. And what I can do is I can come right from my heart. I love that you've created that. You're brilliant at this. I can see. I'm so glad I'm here. Now, what did I just do? I created, I created a feeling in you. And that feeling is, hey, you might want to do this again with me. That's not why I'm doing it, but that might be a feeling you have. Or you might say to yourself, you know, God, I want to be more a part of Jerry and his life and what he does because I really feel inspired by it. I've learned these concepts. God knows my, my father didn't have that. Uh, he had other skills that he taught me, but he also taught me not how not to do it. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to be a teacher, if I'm going to be a coach, and I'm going to be a good parent, I better get that act together. I better learn those things. So I've, you know, in my psychology uh, journey, uh, I learned how to, how to work with group process. I learned how to how to help uh, individual development. And, 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 and so when we look at human development and we look at all, you know, Maslow, the hierarchy of needs and, and, and other psychologists and people who have done great things, uh, you learn it. So, so who I am with you right now is not even close to who I was at 22, 23 when I was first coaching. I mean, I had no clue. And it was all learned. And as I mentioned before, after all these years, I'm halfway there, which tells me I'm a lifelong learner. It also tells me there is more to learn, and I'm open to learning that. So for all of the people listening, and to your point, Dan, we can learn to be an inspiration to our athletes. And I'll say this. I've had tremendous success training coaches in large groups. That's what John, John O'Sullivan, my partner, who is a friend of yours, Dan, John and I are going to be putting on our seventh annual, it's going to be virtual, uh, coaching conference. We're going to have Steve Kerr there this year. Oh, fantastic. Uh, last year, we had uh, Quinn Snyder from the Utah Jazz. Uh, we had such an amazing lineup of people. And this, this week, this year, it's going to be the same. We're going to get coaches from six continents. We're going to get coaches from 14, 15 countries. We'll have so many coaches there, and what we're going to do is we're going to help them to learn how to be inspirational, how to win the relationship game. Because winning the relationship game, you do through by being inspirational. Was Dean Smith trying to be inspirational? He wasn't trying. It was him. He got that way by feeling himself being that way, which goes back to the feeling equals function. And when you're feeling that way and you're inspiring people – that's what great coaches do, and that's 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 the road that we take. So we we have to their skills. 
I, and, and in that book, the Win the Day, and in the book, The Competitive Buddha, which is a, another recent one, and this next one coming out uh, in April, uh, which is called uh, Everyday Champion Wisdom, I'm helping coaches, leaders, to find ways to penetrate the armor of people they work with because so many people's hearts are protected. They have a sheet of armor over them. And I want to penetrate that. I want to open my heart. So my whole job, my, my whole work is, is, is to, uh, I want to win your heart, Dan. Mm-hmm. I want to win your heart. And you know what? I'm going to win it. I know how. And I'm going to do it. And why do I want to do it? I want to do it because if I win your heart, you're going to go the distance for me. And if I'm your coach, I want you to go the distance. Why? Because I want you to be a better person, a better athlete. I want you to be the best version of yourself. That's what coaching is. It's not about me. Nothing to do with me. I'm just a tool. I'm a vehicle. In fact, I'm a hole in a flute. You know, and the breath of all these great people that I've studied and who are mentors to me, that breath comes through the flute and it comes out the hole and you're receiving all of that breath from all of these other people. I've been standing on the shoulders of giants for years. And so now I have the opportunity uh, to help coaches. Back to your point, I help coaches how to be inspirational. But more than anything is how to be effective and win the relationship game so that they can get the work that they need done and the athletes can be the best versions of themselves. So I've got one more little curveball question before we finish off by talking about your... uh, What What kind of question was that? A curveball. I don't know if it's going to be a tricky question. It's not tricky. It's just it, it, it interests me with relation to the philosophies that you're talking about. So right now you're immersed in this work around vision and values to create this high performing or kind caring culture and it's it's inspirational work it's fantastic work you're helping develop inspirational leaders so you're working with a coach or set of coaches and they're creating their vision they're um they're building their values they're helping their players do this and then up rocks Dennis Rodman. Now, like millions of people globally, in the last couple of years, um, I've watched that 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 very popular right, uh, right. Net, Netflix documentary uh, that, that that detailed um, the the trials and the tribulations of the Chicago Bulls uh, throughout the nineties. So you're working on this on this. You've got this vision. It's exciting. It's an inspiring. Uh, vision you know you're you're a great coach you're you're uh, a coach who knows the x's and o's you know but you care about people as well so you're striving to build relationships you've put your values down you're, you're helping players let's say adhere to those values but up pops uh this this person who ultimately let's use this word has a great deal of talent a great deal of ability but perhaps likes to Uh, head up to Las Vegas (laughs) for a weekend away um, in the championship season towards the end of it. Mm. What conversations are you having there? What, where does that lie for you here? Well, that's, that's right in my wheelhouse. I mean, that's, (laughs) that's a direct hit to my heart, right? You win the relationship game, but you need compassion, right? You need compassion and who better to help with that idea than Phil Jackson, right? Another mm. he's a friend of mine. He's used my books with his Bulls and Lakers and stuff. And and uh, he even made the statement one time. He said, without compassion, that team wouldn't have gone anywhere. And it, it, it's the idea of not only compassion for others, but compassion for yourself, self-compassion. So someone like a Phil, and, and so you're – for me personally, what, what I would do as a coach is I would want to have as one of my values on that team is compassion. Mm-hmm. And we would have that conversation. So I would go to the, you know, the chapter that I wrote on compassion. And what I do is uh, I'd have a discussion on compassion and why it's important and why we all need to understand that. If we're going to go anywhere without compassion, we're not going to, we're not going to have a championship. So Compassion is important. Phil, Phil Jackson even mentioned without, without compassion uh, and love, which mm-hmm. is related, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, you can't have 
you, you can't have compassion without love and you can't have love without compassion. You just can't. And you might have to learn how to be compassionate because all of these values that we're talking about, you learn. You know, if you're having a, if you're having a, uh, a value of selflessness on a team, half the team might need to learn how to become selfless. Oh, here's how you're selfless. Watch, watch Dan over here. Did you see the way he, he handled it? You know, he, he's picking up the balls on this pitch after practice. No one's asked him to do it. He's just giving of himself. He's selfless. Does everybody see that? Think about ways you can be selfless. So I'm teaching selflessness. Back to compassion. Did you see the way uh, uh, Steve Kerr talked to Dennis Rodman? Did you see how, how he, that's compassion. We all need compassion in our personal lives. We need compassion on this team. And that's going to drive us to places we've never been before. And of course, the other part of that is extremely important, which is self-compassion. And I think, you know, when you're dealing with a person like, dealing isn't the word I want to use. When, when you're working with, when you're working, and dealing seems so pejorative sometimes, you know, but when you're working with a, uh, an interesting, uh, unconventional person, such as a Dennis Rodman, mm-hmm. You need to have that conversation. You do. And uh, Phil had that conversation to his credit. And he understood. He, Phil understood. He took the time to listen to Dennis. And that's part of a skill set that we need to learn again. you know. So coaches need to be better listeners. So when you sit down and talk with Dennis, you really get to understand him as a person, not as a player, but as a human being. And that's why you love him. You love Dennis Rodman because he's a human being. And yeah, he might have areas of life where he has to develop this part of himself. But you're his coach, in case you forgot. And you've got to do things to bring that out in him. And so you have these conversations. So I really appreciate the question. It's, it's extremely valuable uh, to, to, to reflect upon. And for anyone listening to this conversation, uh, Dan, uh, we need to think about there's nobody out there that we can't love. There's a lot of people we might not like. I mean, I have four children. I'm going to be bluntly honest with you. There are days that I don't like them. You know, my, my oldest son, some days I just don't like him, but I love him. I'll do anything for him. And there's a difference. So as a coach, we need to love people. And you say to me, Jerry, why do I need to love this one? I want him to be the perfect kid, just like all the others, right? And I say, no, he can't be, you know, because he's immature. He's, uh, uh, he's afraid. You're dealing with an athlete who has tremendous fear. Understand that as a coach. But love him because he's a human being. And deep down inside, if you coach him and win the relationship game with him, they will go the, he will go the distance or she will go the distance with you. So compassion, love, connection, caring. Again, Phil Jackson said, without love, I would never win a championship. Without compassion, I would never win a championship. How's that? So, and I promised you that we were going to talk, <laughs> talk about your book to finish off, but I do have, you sparked one more question in me. Mm-hmm. Did Michael Jordan have compassion? Uh, next question. (laughs) (laughs) You know, he's the greatest, arguably the greatest basketball player of all time. Yeah. And, and this is what I took. I mean, and we need to be, you know, ethically, uh, for me personally, I want to be ethically careful here because I I don't know Michael Jordan and, and and and, I don't either. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the, I mean, and I, I think this is where sort of the love that I, I wrote down earlier, actually, as you were speaking, which I sort of haven't come on to, I wrote down love versus toughness as an example. Are there binary continuums here? Are there, is there a bit more complexity? No. If, if Michael Jordan had had no. greater compassion, might he not have been as good a player as he was? Or am I getting uh, that wrong? And I don't know. The answer is, I don't know. However, I do have an opinion. And that is, look, we don't know. Yep. We'll never know. Yep. Uh, compassion and toughness and love are not mutually exclusive. We know that compassion and love are connected. But when you bring in being tough on people, 
you know, there's such a thing as tough love. I, yeah. they, they're not mutually exclusive. You can't, uh, you, you, you got to neutralize the duality there. You were either tough on someone or you love them. No, no, no. In fact, what the irony of it is, this is the greatest paradox, is if I really love you, Dan, I'm going to be all over you if you're not doing it right. Hmm. If, in fact, I teach athletes that are afraid to compete against their teammates. I say, you talk about loving your teammate. Well, why don't you play hard against them? Why don't you bring them your best game? Why don't you fight and be tough on them? And I tell coaches, you know what? You've got to be, look, loving an athlete means you can still be demanding. Let's use the word demanding. Michael was very demanding of his teammates. He had a vision of what they could be. And by being demanding, was he loving them? I think he was. That's my opinion. I think I really believe he loved his teammates. He loved the team as a whole. And he gave them tough love. He, what he did was he demanded from them. He would not tolerate anything less than, than them bringing their A game. So, so, so let, and I love that answer. It was actually John O'Sullivan, your your colleague and our friend, who I heard. I first heard the quote "demanding but but not demeaning" from, mm -hmm. and that, that may the genesis of that may have been from you. So, demanding but not demeaning, and too often I see on Twitter. Um, yep, I'm one of those people on Twitter. Um, clips of coaches, um, and quite often basketball coaches who look like they're being demeaning they're being demanding and demeaning on that sideline do you still think we've got to continue to help coaches find that sweet spot if you like of well in, you know when we when we uh, experience compassion we can be demanding but there is a line where it can't cross over into demeaning or and or bullying yeah and we we know that line. Mm. We just don't stay mindful of that line. And there is a fine line. I demand from you. I pres when, I, when I demand from my kids or my coaches or from my, team, my, my, my players, I tell them, I'm going to ask a lot of you. And right now, I demand, I'll even use the word, I demand that this happens. And the reason I'm demanding, I'll tell you why I'm demanding, is because I love you so much that I wouldn't want anything less than your very best right now. And as your coach, I can see that you're not at the top of your game, and I demand that you do this, this, and this to help you get there. Demeaning is when you're using harsh names, criticism with calling names, uh, uh, indicating verbally or non-verbally that, that people are not important, that they're not valued, that you don't care about them. That's, that's the meaning. And uh, there are a lot of dysfunctional, we call them dysfunctional leaders out there who just don't know the difference. And they don't realize that they can demand without being demeaning. And, and you know, or they haven't learned that skill, right? Or they haven't learned that skill. I think it's more of an awareness. They're not okay. aware. They don't have the awareness. Okay. And uh, once you're aware, see, again, it's the power of your influence. It's never neutral. You could light it up or you can cast it into darkness. The key to lighting it up is the more aware you are of the power of your influence, Dan, the more you have a say in the outcome. In a room filled with 3,000 coaches, I, I ask them, raise your hand if you don't want to have a say in the outcome and I never see a hand go up. I said, that's your influence. If you want to have a say, you have to be mindful of what you're saying and how you're communicating, whether you're listening or not. You have to be aware that these are the kind of things that will cast your team into darkness. These are the kind of things that will cast your team into brightness and to light up the whole team in that way. So th there is a line. I want to make sure in my work that a coach understands the power of their influence. It's never neutral and that we can learn to inspire, to light up their lives 
and to be the guide and the mentor and the teacher that we were meant to be and that we want to be, but they're going to have to learn the skill set unless they don't have, if they don't have it. Now, I, I, I don't want to repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fascinating stuff. And I, I, yeah. uh, everything completely resonates with me. I actually just wanted to finish off by discussing your new book because I know all of this stuff um, and more is going to feature in it. Um, so, so give us, give us to finish things off today, give us a lowdown on your new book that's out in April. Okay. Uh, let me preface it with this. Uh, COVID has been a crisis throughout the world. Mm. Uh, but like the Chinese say, from every crisis comes opportunity. And this crisis has given me the opportunity to not travel. And I took advantage of that opportunity. And so in the last three years, I have written and published three books. Wow. Yeah. I, I've never done this before, but I, I wanted to make use of the time and I wanted to stay relevant. And so uh, actually it's four books out of six years. Uh, that said, Win the Day was one of them uh, that we've been talking about. The other one is called The Competitive Buddha which is really uh, people say, well, the Buddha doesn't compete. Well, the Buddha does compete. The, the Buddha was one of the first student athletes ever and competed at very high levels. He was mm -hmm. an archer and a wrestler. Uh, and the competitive Buddha to compete like a Buddha means uh, you, uh, you embrace your opponent as a partner who will show up to help you be the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, uh, uh, the theme of that. But this new book, okay, very interestingly enough, is called Everyday Champion Wisdom. Now, I've done tons of blogs, tons of podcasts. Uh, I've written uh, so many books. I've had, like, I think this is my 15th book. I've given thousands of talks over a 40 year career. Uh, I have all of these notes, I have all this material. And I'm thinking, if someone wanted to know what Jerry Lynch has done, uh, how are they going to go read 15 books? How are they going to go read all the, you know, it's impossible. So what I did was I came up with this idea of taking snippets from every source of my input in, in the world. And it's almost like if you hear like the best of the Beatles, right? The, the Beatle uh, yep, yep. album. The greatest the best, hits. The, the greatest, the greatest hits. So – I came up with this idea. Why don't I come up with a book that is the greatest hits of Jerry and take bits of every book, of every talk, of every blog, of every everything conference that I've given and take the highlights and put them into one book so that a coach out there, if rather than saying, well, it's impossible, I can't get into his, it's, he's, it's just too much. No, here's the one book that you could read that will summarize everything. Now, how is that possible? because it's an everyday book of wisdom. So every chapter, every there are 150 lessons. These are lessons. And the lesson is one page or maybe a page and a quarter. So you and I both know that most people out there, they have a very low tolerance for, for reading books. Mm. They, they don't have the bandwidth to, and I understand that totally, we're busy. Yep. And you can't, you see a book that's 300 pages, like I can't get through that. So I've made it accessible so that a coach can say, oh, I can open up Jerry's book here. I'm going to read this one page and it's going to be on selflessness. And I'm going to bring that back to my team and see how that works. Great. Wonderful. All right. It worked. I'm going to open up Jerry's book again. Let's see. What is this now? This is about patience or this is about uh, the relationship game. One page. So it's a everyday meditative contemplative book of lessons that I have determined are the highlights of my career and the most important things that I feel I've taught over a long duration. So uh, it comes out in April and uh, for sure it'll be uh, probably advertised on my website, which is uh, uh, wayofchampions.com. Uh, and it will be on Amazon for sure and uh, published by Coach's Choice. Well, um, I'm certainly excited about getting that book and diving in um, every day to, to learn from your wisdom. And I know um, 
you will have tapped the interest of the sports psych show audience. You've given us a bit of an indication already as to how people can get in touch. So is, is that the case, Jerry? It would just be through your website, wayofchampions.com. Yeah, my, my email too uh, is wayofchampions at gmail.com. There we go. So you, that's can, a, that's you, can reach, you can reach the man himself. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jerry, I can't thank you. Uh, enough for your time today it's been absolutely fascinating i've really enjoyed it i've learned loads taken loads of notes and um yeah just thank you so much for your time well thank you for inspiring me i get off this call and um i might have what i need to start my next book <laughs> <laughs> well, we, been... we, we've got our joint book already um hoop heads so we got uh, that we'll, okay we'll so that. Uh, i'll definitely be on that book with you <laughs> well Thanks so much, Jerry. Thanks for your time. Oh, you're more than welcome. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast. And I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Psych Show. I'd be delighted to hear any suggestions that you might have for me. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now. <laughs>